Hola, muchas gracias por venir al último día del Festival Gelatina. Eh, ahora tenemos una charla performativa del colectivo de artistas Pacu y Hardware, que también han, forman parte de la exposición Ahogarse en un mar de datos, que podéis verla porque acaba mañana, o sea, yo aprovecharía. Y después tenemos eh, en la sala un concierto de Melissa Tuntun y Katia Barret. Y, y eso es todo. Gracias. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much all for coming. Um, my name is Nerenga and this is Ugnus. We are Pakui Hardware, so called. Um, we want to thank La Casa Encendida and Gelatina Festival for inviting us to Madrid. It's nice to be back again and finally see the exhibition because unfortunately we couldn't be here for the opening and it's beautiful, you have to go and see before it's closed. And uh, this, this thing that you're going to see today um, was born of the material that we were digging and reading and writing and so it's a combination of our own work and thoughts and many other voices um, so you cannot distinguish what's what and yeah thanks again My name is T. Dorney. I'm an itty bitty jellyfish but I have a secret power no humans have. Sings the Japanese scientist and after our singer-songwriter, Shin Kubota, who has been studying the tiny Turritopsis dorney jellyfish for decades. Every day, like an attentive parent, he feeds them and looks after ideal conditions for thriving and multiplications of these jellyfish, talking to them gently while exploring through a microscope. Kubota is patiently seeking to solve that secret power of the jellyfish. That secret is immortality. Turritopsis dorni, or in other way called immortal jellyfish, has entered the radar of wider circle of scientists quite recently, around early 2000s, when in 2003, a completed human genome project revealed that although it has been estimated that our genome contain more than 100,000 protein coding genes. It turned out that the number was closer to 21,000. This meant we had about the same number of genes as chickens, roundworms, and fruit flies. In a separate study published in 2005, Snidarians were found to have much more complex genome than previously imagined. Or if we use the words of Hydra specialist Professor Daniel Martinez, genetically, Hydra are the same as human beings. We are variations of the same theme. Same theme or not, one of the variations, even without backbone or brains, manages to rejuvenate itself without physically dying. Dispersed around Mediterranean and in the waters around Japan, the tiny Turritopsis dorni jellyfish manages to escape pure death by transforming itself from a grown-up medusa back to polyp or their colonies. They're like Hydra version of Benjamin Button, aging in reverse. From the polyps, the jellyfish can once again develop into grown-up medusa, again and again, endlessly. This process scientifically is described as transdifferentiation, also known as lineage reprogramming. It is a process in which one mature cell transforms into another type of cell. Cells de-differentiate and then re-differentiate into the cell type of interest. Mark Doty, difference. The jellyfish float in the bay shallows like school of clouds, a dozen identical, 
Is it right to call them creatures? These elaborate sacks of nothing? All they seem is shape and shifting. And though a whole troop of undulant cousins go about their business within a, within a single wave span, everyone does something unlike. This one, a balloon, open on both ends, but swollen to its full expanse. This one, a breathing heart. This, a pulsing flower. This one, a roll condom or a plastic purse swallowing itself. That one, a Tiffany shade. This, a troubled parasol. This, submarine operas, all subvertuge and disguise. Its plot, a fabulous tangle of hiding and recognition. Nothing but trope. Nothing but something forming itself into figures, then refiguring. Sheer ectoplasm, recognizable only as the step of metaphor. What can words do but link what we know to what we don't and so form a shape which shrinks or swells, configures or collapses, blooms even as it is described into some unlikely marine chiffon, a gown for Isadora, nothing but style. What binds one shape to another also sets them apart. But what's lovelier than the shape shifting, transparent, of like and as. Clear, undulant words. We look at alien grace, unfettered by any determined form, and we say balloon, flower, heart, condom, opera, lampshade, parasol, ballet. Hear how the mouth, so full of longing for the world, changes its shape? Until today, scientists have not been able to clearly track down how this transdifferentiation is possible in the bodies of jellyfish. How cells transform themselves without dying. The secrets of jellyfish are beyond our words, beyond our metaphors and mouths. It is important to note, however, that transformation of grown-up medusa back into its embryo state of polyps has its own price. This price is stress. Jellyfish turn into polyps only in cases of ex ex experience heavy distress and discomfort from the environment, or if their bodies undergo direct physical injuries. Stress, for some, brings rejuvenation. While the other variation of the theme is stressing out because even if armed with contemporary laboratory equipment and 21st century pool of knowledge, it still cannot surmount the stubborn secret fortress of the jellyfish. Regenerative medicine, together with tissue engineering, go hand in hand, or with rather say cell in cell, in researching for ways to transform the potential of cells to become something different, to change, into clear and tangible formations. These branches of science deal with the process of replacing, engineering, or re-engineering human cells, tissues or organs, to restore or establish normal function. This field holds the promise of engineering damaged tissues and organs by stimulating the body's own repair mechanisms to functionally heal previously irreparable tissues and organs. Regenerative medicine also includes the possibility of growing tissues and organs in the laboratory or in vitro, autonomously from the body, and implanting them when the body cannot heal itself. If a regenerated organ cells would be derived from the patient's own cells, this would potentially solve the problem of the shortage of organs available for donation and the problem of organ transplant rejection. It has also immense potential working towards longevity, postponing death until much, much later, if not deleting it at all. At the same time, separated from the body, 
this new biological formation enter another space apart from the laboratory. They enter so-called tissue economy, in which biological life and its potential is speedily commodified. Albeit tissue engineering and regenerative medicine have successfully grown patches of skin, parts of muscles, cartilages of joints and urinary bladders, human heart, as always, remains the greatest challenge. Artificially and autonomously grown hearts are simply incapable to pump, pump and circulate blood. Its contractions are too weak. But does not pulsating heart resemble translucent body of jellyfish pushing itself through the water? A group of scientists from California Technology Institute and Harvard University transformed the similarity into a new and promising functioning mechanism for an artificial organism. The body of Medusa larvae, or if we use its beautiful Greek name, Euphira, became a model for a synthetic medusoid. The shape of Euphira's body was reproduced, was reproduced in silicon polymer. Next, they printed a pattern made of protein under the membrane that resembled the muscle architecture of the real animal. The protein pattern serves as a roadmap for growing an organization of dissociated rat tissue, individual heart muscle cells that retain the ability to contract into coherent swimming muscle. This tiny, less than one millimeter biosilicon body immersed into a petri dish with liquid and electrified with light electric impulses started to move like an actual biological jellyfish. Contracts, releases. Contracts, releases. Contracts, releases. Like you fear in water, like heart in the body. Effortless aquatic choreography of the jellyfish might become the pulsation dance of our future artificial hearts. Next to a specific and tangible tasks of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering, such as growing organs or reverse engineer cells, the overall target is aging. When aging of body is treated as a disease, the longevity promise of the immortal jellyfish, Toritopsis dorni, gains a whole new value, literally speaking. Trading biological promises or promises of promises, to be more exact, is what a theorist and scholar Melinda Cooper calls embryonic futures market. The cells of immortal jellyfish here end up in the same market as embryonic human stem cells. However, this market involves not only biological cells, but also all the potentials of those cells. As human embryonic cells have the potential to un unlimitedly proliferate and virtually become any type of specialized cells, they're the hottest, albeit ethically most complex object of biotechnological and molecular research, as well as target for market. In her book, Life as Surplus, Biotechnology and Capitalism in the Neoliberal Era, Melinda Cooper traces how the transformation of capitalism from the industrial, Fordist era into late financial capitalism equally altered the biotechnological industry. In Fordist type of capitalism, the main revenue is production of tangible objects and trade of shares of those tangible things. While in financial capitalism, the main market is trade of intangible futures and share themselves. Market becomes detached from tangible objects, tangible goods. It converts into purely abstract and virtual numbers, equations, and simply gambling. Speculation becomes the core of post-forwarded for post production. According to Cooper, What stem cells seek to produce is not potential organism, not, not, nor even this or that particular type of differentiated cell, but rather biological promise itself, 
in a state of nascent transformability. More precisely, it seeks to discover the culture conditions under which the biological promise becomes self-regenerative, self-accumulative, and self-renewing. It wants to culture the embryonic stem cells in such a way that it is able to perpetually regenerate its own potentiality in the form of not-yet-realized surplus of life. In other words, contemporary bioscience does not seek to merely commodify biological life. This would be still a this type of capitalism attached to production and marketization of tangible goods, but rather to capitalize on the transmutation of biological life into speculative surplus value. Unity of biological body is fragmented into cells, which is further fragmented in transforming cells into pure biological pr promise pure speculations of the future. In one particular field, such speculations are already monopolized. Geron Corporation, which specializes in all aspects of cellular aging and exploits regenerative potential of cellular immortalization, has already monopolized human embryonic stem cell market in the United States. And even if due to their immense unpredictability, the actual products have not brought exceptional high revenue, their main investment is potential futures. That is, this company has intellectual rights of all inventions which have, are, or will use Garon products for scientific and medical research and tests. Thus life, as its most unpredictable, will already have been pre-capitalized. 目を取って。はい。いかがです。ほくろも残しちゃったんですかああ、多少汚し気味の方が帰って生きてくるんですよ。早速かぶり染めをしてみませんか。やはり落ち着くところに落ち着かせてみないと本当の感じはつかみにく
こうやって少しずつ薬品をなじませてやるわけですゆっくり唇を左右に引いてみてくれませんかはい元に戻してしばらく温度を上げたままでいろいろと表情筋を動かしながら年齢にふさわしいシワを刻み込んでやろうっていうわけですこのままじゃ変にのっぺりしていていかにも不自然でしょうもう一度口を動かしてみてはいいいでしょうあとはおしゃべりするなり何な,なり自由にしていただいて結構ですから汗で仮面が起き上がってしまうようなことは接着剤に感染を収縮させる薬を入れてあります最初は幾分息苦しいかもしれない皮膚呼吸が完全に妨げられているわけですからねいい力がいるな萩尾の濁音を出すのに<笑>いいでしょう声にも多少変化がついた方が一つ注意事項として厳守していただきたいのは十二時間以上の連続使用を絶対に避けていただきたいというその間皮膚を窒息状態に置いているわけですからはいそれにしてもよくもここまで変わっちまったもんだ大したもんだわ。While the tiny immortal jellyfish perhaps don't even realize their immense role in the human search for immortality and longevity, apart from those that are put under stress in laboratories around the world, of course, the involvement of their bodies cell by cell in the promises of biocapitalism, horseshoe crabs are stressing out about it much more gravely. Due to its exceptional antiseptic qualities, The blue blood of these aristocrats is harvested in tons of for medical purposes. Caught in the ocean or collected in artificial farms, horseshoe crabs are taken to blood harvesting centers in which they obviously involuntarily sacrifice around 30% of their blood. Even, if, even after such procedures, horseshoe crabs are returned, well, maybe not always, back into their former territories. Because of the stress experienced in the laboratories or on the way, a big number of them do not survive, and the fertility of female crabs in the recent years plummeted to dangerous lows. Few of us realize just how valuable the horseshoe crab is. When I first started 37 years ago, we were allowed to harvest them. There was no、uh, recording, there was nothing. And they became fair game, and I was involved with selling them for bait. And then a doctor came down, and he said that if I didn't sell bait crabs anymore, he would be interested in the laboratory. Normal fishing is you know, you catch it, you ice it, and you deliver it to the table, and you eat it. The horseshoe crabs, we actually catch them, take them to the lab, and they bleed them, and then we bring them back and release them.、So We're borrowing the crabs, is really what we're doing. All right, well, you say we go unload this. All right. <laughs> crabs that are borrowed end up a couple of hours away at the Endosafe Laboratories in Charleston. Here in this alien world, they're given a rigorous cleaning to prep them for the process ahead. For the past 30 years, the biomedical industry. Has been mining the medical equivalent of gold. Endosafe is one of only four labs in the world that produces a derivative of horseshoe crab blood. Their blood has a clotting agent that's used to detect minute levels of bacteria. But what's truly surprising is the color. The crab's blue blood is an evolutionary gift that's helped them survive the eons. 
existing on this planet for about 450 million years and living fossils called animals are slowly approaching extinction in the name of our longevity. Stress brings rejuvenation. Perhaps thanks to these alien-looking aristocratic crabs, which in fact recently appeared to be aquatic spiders, and immortal jellyfish, we will slowly be able to call ourselves living fossils. Excavation of secret powers, their tacit knowledge or entire body parts of non-human species in the search for rejuvenation, transform scientists into contemporary shamans. They both seek to transcend given biological limitations to cross boundaries of enclosed body. Some of them use masks as tools, the others microscopes, bodily extensions beyond the biological surfaces of bodies, externalized, like those tissues and organs, former parts of unified body, yet with their own gain autonomy, zombie tissues and organs, without centralized brain, without system, generating surplus of life, organs without bodies, shamanic masks without shamans, What kind of Frankenstein-like formations would these tissues create if gain non-human regenerative qualities? Would they manage to escape the tissue economy of biocapitalism? Or would they have an inexplicable secretive plan like those tons of jellyfish that more and more frequently block the cooling system of nuclear power plants sitting on the shores of seas and oceans? Warming and acidifying waters and declining numbers of predatory fish are real greenhouse conditions for the rapid proliferation. Changing water temperatures are pushing jellyfish into new waters. They're on the move. Clogged water power plants, reactors, clogged fishing nets, clogged oceans. Jellyfish are Magadon. This is one side of the story told from the human perspective, oriented towards efficiency and smooth and continuous excavations of resources. Same altering conditions could also force jellyfish to mutate, to adapt in ways that are new to them too. Soft bodies are more flexible for that, however. Even the corals lose their skeletons and become soft in unfavorable conditions like they do in the Red Sea, to wait until the circumstances are better for them to calcify again. Softness wins against hard shields, liquidity against solidification. If we listen to the ideas of hydrofeminism and conceive our bodies as liquid in an enormous hypersea, fluid and at the same time contained, testing other bodies and give it out our own, then our intra-being with other species, with each other, could become not that of appropriation and usurpation, but of collaboration. Perhaps if we see ourselves more as jellyfish, transparent, following the currents, but managing to select the right ones, we could learn to accept these new autonomous technobiological hybrids as equal actors, to mutate ourselves, adopting to the rapidly changing conditions, learn from the softness. Jellyfish are already involved in our economic and technological assemblages anyway. It is they who will cut off your electricity. But this is, this is the future. Speculations on which we can only bet in the thriving futures market. For now, we bet on non-human regeneration, on the immortal Turritopsis dorni jellyfish. <laughs> Bokun 
だけど僕には人にない特別な秘密があるんだ僕は僕は若返ることができるんだもうダメだと思ったらポリプに戻ってワンツースリー Thank you. That's it. <laughs> うちの名前はベニクラゲちっちゃいちっちゃいクラゲですだけどうちには人にない特別な秘密があるのようちはうちは若返ることができるのよもうダメだわと思ったらオンリプーに戻ってワンツースリーまたまた人生をやり直すことができるのよみんなは一度だけの人生だから今を大切にしておくれあそれでにべに私の名前はベニクラゲもうすぐポニプに戻れるぞ今度送れる人生で何をしようかしやんちゅうわしはわしはわかがえることができるんだ二十歳のピチピチな体に今から戻るぞきくみ今から人生 Hola, os recordamos que ahora en 15 minutos tenemos el concierto de Melissa Tuntun y Katia Barret en la sala A y con ello cerraremos el festival. Muchas gracias.